Hi everyone. My name is Rob Packard. I'm the president of Medical Device Academy. We're offering a new course series. It's a lead auditor course. In the past I was an instructor for BSI and I taught a lead auditor course that was titled um, ISO 9001 with emphasis on 1345. And it was a four and a half day course and I love teaching that course. But it's very long. It was like 10 hour days. There'd be 10 piece of people in the class, and by the end of the day, everybody was pretty tired and just wanted to go to bed. But over time teaching that class, I saw lots of areas where I could condense the material down and say, you know, really this is something people should come to the class already knowing this so we could chop this piece out. Honestly, nobody should be training to become a lead auditor if they don't know what ISO 1345 is. The other thing that was really missing from that course was there was nothing in there about 21 CFR 820. So if your company is doing business in the US, is marketing a product that's regulated by CDRH, you need to be compliant with 21 CFR 820, the QSR. And so that's not covered in there. And who cares about 9001? Honestly, very few companies actually have ISO 9001 in everything that's in ISO 9001 is covered in ISO 1345, two little things. So what we really needed was a lead auditor course out there that didn't spend a lot of time on the basics and concentrated just on how to be an auditor, how to lead an audit, how to program, manage an audit program, and it needed to include not only ISO 1345, but it needed to have an emphasis on 21 CFR 820. So you're ready for FDA inspections. So that's what this new course is all about. And we, we wanted to make it available in multiple cities, so we selected quite a few cities over here. I think I can get my little pointer here working. So over here we have different cities where it's offered. Some of them are strategically located where you have an FDA regional office like Irvine or Nashville. Uh, Raleigh would be another one. And some of these are located, uh, like this is the day before we have the Minneapolis uh, conference for MDM. So some of these are strategically located where it'll be convenient for people to go to, and they're located in a convenient location where hopefully we can get a guest from the FDA to stop by for lunch and answer some Q&A. So we've got uh, our other instructor working on trying to get those invites, but uh, no guarantees yet. Mentioning our other instructor, this is Leo Legro. Uh, Leo is um, an ex-FDA inspector, but he's not all that, he hasn't been out of the FDA for very long. He was there just last year. So he, what makes Leo really unique is he's not just your average inspector. He was in the FDA a very long time, and his favorite thing to do is actually training, because he was one of the trainers for other inspectors. So if you're in the southeast, or you're over as far as Louisiana, maybe up to Nashville, in that area, you might have one of the inspectors that he tr personally trained. So here's somebody that not only is a good inspector, but also trained other inspectors and can tell you exactly what they're supposed to be doing by the book, step by step, and why they do it. So that sometimes the why is really important. So this is his credentials. Yes, of course, we're going to cover the standards. We're going to cover ISO 9001-2008 in about 30 seconds. And we're going to cover ISO 1345 because it's very similar to the QSR. But we're going to cover a couple other things. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on these because you really should have these before you even show up for the course. You, you have to be competent in the standards before you take the course. So if you're not, visit our website and we offer webinars on these topics like 14971, 1345. And then there are some other standards that are important that we are going to cover in the course. One of them is ISO 19011-2011. This is the latest version of the standard that tells you how to be an auditor. And it has some really valuable tools in there, like how to do remote auditing in Appendix B. And then there's the guidance document on how to apply 1345. We're not going to cover that, though, because I like another one much better. It's 1345+. plus. It's a Canadian guidance document. And it actually gives you helpful suggestions in there for, for what an auditor would ask. It also has some really cool tools in there, like a list of all the required procedures, a list of all the required records. These are valuable tools. We're also going to touch for a little bit on 17021, which is the requirements for certification bodies to do ISO audits, but only a little bit of time. The focus is not the standards.
The focus is making sure you're ready for the FDA, the accusative inspection process. So throughout the, the training, you're going to see, here's what you do in ISO, here's what you do for an FDA inspection. And then the most important thing, as an internal auditor or a lead auditor in your company, this is how you want to do it to make sure you're prepared for both. So yes, you should be familiar with the QZIP manual and you should be familiar with these seven different subsystems, the majors, the minors. So we're, throughout the presentation, we're going to use little symbols like this to identify when it's a major subsystem, those four majors that are so important. As I said, we're going to cover ISO 19001. In th so throughout the presentation, when we're training people, we have little references and we actually put the uh, section number in the presentation for ISO 19,011, what section it is, and here's a copy of the cover page. So that way people can look that up. We don't provide a copy of ISO 19,011. You can buy your own copy, electronic or paper, both are available. We also cover the basics. A lot of people get this wrong. They, don't, they think everything's third-party BS, a third-party consultant did it. But in actuality, there are three different types of audits. We have first-party audits, those are internal audits. We have second party audits, those are of your supplier. Wherever we're talking about differences between an internal audit and a supplier audit, we use the symbol in our presentations to identify this is a difference for suppliers. And then also we have the third party audits. So this would be audits by a certification body such as BSI that I used to work for, or it could also be a third party inspection by the FDA or the new medical device single um, single audit program that's uh, being piloted, so MD-SAP. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. We're going to give you some interviewing tools. So these are, this is a really important one to sort of train yourself to ask open-ended questions, not close-ended questions that are just yes or no. Get people to give more information on an existing question, so encourage them to, to expand on the answer. Uh, give their opinion. Um, Nonverbal, so you might um, do things nonverbally to encourage them to give you more information uh, or to suggest that you, you question their response or, or surprised by it and see if they try to offer up more information. You can repeat the question with different wording if they didn't quite get the question. Um, hypothetical questions are sometimes helpful. Sometimes you use a yes or no. Oftentimes these are really helpful at the beginning to sort of break the ice and get people comfortable. And then if you really want to make them uncomfortable, you just give them silence. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the interviewing techniques that we're going to talk about and we're actually going to do some role playing uh, briefly during the presentations. Um, and we're going to talk about note taking, the important things to actually take down in your notes. And then of course we want you to type that and how to summarize those notes into your uh, reports. We're going to give you examples of checklists. This is an example that's available uh, for free internationally. It's the GE210 audit checklist for Health Canada. It describes how to apply ISO 1345 uh, in the ISO 1345 requirements, and then it compares it to the Canadian requirements section by section, and then it gives you a suggested question. One of the things one of my auditee trainees pointed out, though, is every single question in here is a closed-ended question. So if you're going to use this checklist as a source of ideas, you might want to think about how you would reword the questions so they're not just closing the questions. Another thing we'll cover is highlighting SOPs. So a lot of people will use a procedural approach to audit, and they will actually pull out an SOP for the area they're going to audit, and they'll go through and look at key items that they want to verify are actually being used. So are they using this form? Do they cover all the clauses in a year, even though that's not required? Do they do that kind of stuff? And so they'll actually have a copy of the procedure and they're highlighted. But those two methods, the, the uh, checklist approach and the procedural approach, or this one's also called the element approach, these aren't the best ways. The best way is turtle diagrams or the process approach. So here's a little bit of a history for you. There's the Crosby model. That was the original turtle diagram. You didn't call it a turtle diagram, but this was a picture of it. Thank you to Jan Rovers. Um, or Rovers. And then... Um, we have here, we have Plexus Corporation. They claim to have invented the turtle diagram. This is their version. BSI uh, helped us out with a little diagram that included a turtle so we would know where the name came from. But this is Medical Device Academies. So we've got a color coded. There's a reason for the color coding that I'm going to cover in a second. But the key thing here is it's a seven steps 
process. So you've got the shell of the turtle, that's the first step, and then inputs and outputs. What equipment and facilities, calibrated devices, software, people, procedures and forms, and then metrics or quality objectives. So it's a seven-step approach. And if you're interested, uh, there's a link here for a webinar on the topic uh, that we recorded. So that gives you some of the details. But then we actually practice it in this course as well. And this is by far the number one most effective tool for performing an audit. I don't use the other methods very often because this one is so effective and works for 90%. But there are times when the other two are helpful. And then, of course, we have the adjacent link auditing model. So this is a new model that uh, Bridget Glass and I developed last year, early in the year, and then I wrote an article about it in Bone Zone, so there's a link to that article. But the concept, the color coding, blue and red again, if you're auditing the complaint process, a lot of people just think about, you know, did they follow the procedure for complaints? Did they meet the requirements? And they'll pull out the, the uh, procedure and they'll highlight the different requirements and they'll compare it to the, the requirements of the, uh, the QSR in 820.198, and that, that'll be it. And that meets the requirements for an audit, but it's not an effective audit. To really be an effective audit, you want to see how the complaint handling process interacts with the rest of your quality system. So that's why you use the process approach. And so you look at, do we have CAPAs that were uh, developed out of the complaint handling process? So do we have CAPAs that were initiated and go back into the CAPA process? And did we review the trend of complaints and did we review the CAPAs in our manager reviews? Another thing is the complaint, the output of the complaints, that, that trend history, should go in our post-market surveillance program. And we should be reviewing risk analysis for every single new or increased risk or changes to our uh, trends that we've seen. And when we update that risk analysis, that should also be an input into our design process because we might want to make some design changes to devices. We're, of course, going to cover how to create an audit agenda. So we're going to cover some best practices of that. And of course, we'll give you this template. Um, but we cover how to make it a, an audit agenda for a process approach. So you can see here we're covering more than just 7.3. We cover uh, management responsibilities and authority. We cover document control. We cover monitoring and measuring other processes. We cover risk management. So we show you how to integrate those other processes when you're doing the process approach, even though it says you're auditing one process. Sometimes you're auditing many processes because you're using that process approach. We're going to teach you how to write audit findings. This is probably the most challenging part of being an auditor, to get this part right. And of course, we're going to give you an exam at the end of the course. It's a take home, open book, open note exam. Why? because in a real life environment, you're not told you can't use your notes, you're not told you can't reference the standard, and you have time at home or at the end of the day when you're staying late and everybody else has gone home to write your audit reports. And so we feel you should have the same way to do that for an exam. So we give you the template, we give you a hypothetical scenario, and then you write your audit findings and then we grade those. Some of these uh, newer uh, auditing courses that are all multiple choice, they're easier to grade and they're faster, they don't really test whether you can write an effective audit finding. So we cover this, and this is an example of the best practice. 